some of these. So if you have questions, plenty of time to uh, catch up. Now, moving on to big trees. Caroline does talk about her work in, in the week. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Caroline Patron. I'm a Master of Forest Science candidate. Hopefully, I'll graduate this May. <laughs> um, and I grew up in North Sulawesi, Indonesia. I grew up in these forests and experienced them firsthand. And I also experienced firsthand the pressures they face and the need for policies and research that can help protect and conserve them. And so, for my summer research, I went back home to research these forests and I looked at how these forests changed across an elevation gradient. So, let's jump right into it. So, the tropics are mind blowingly diverse. Approximately two thirds of all living species in the world can be found in the tropics. Scientists try to quantify this diversity through many ways. First, they start from looking at the individual species themselves to where they can be found to what other species can be found in the same general area. And this, this attempt to quantify diversity can be done in a few different ways depending on the scope. Firstly, through looking at alpha diversity, which is individual sites. So how, how diverse is site one or two or three? And then you can also look at gamma diversity, which looks at the whole region, of um, the diversity of a whole region. And the third way you can look at it is through beta diversity, which looks at how different sites are from each other. So sites one and two, or two and three, or one and three, and how they compare against each other. And based on these metrics, some areas can be found to be more biodiverse than others, and can be classified as biodiversity hotspots. And my research site was in one such biodiversity hotspot, the Wallace Biogeographic Region. My study island, Sulawesi, is located in Wallace, which is this hardship region in the heart of Indonesia, and it is located between the Sunda and Samul shells. Now these colors, red and purple, indicate the actual extent of continental Asia and Australia way back when. 45 million years ago, these two shells collided and the collision point was here. And the island of Sulawesi, each of the arms come from different continental origins. They brought with them different species mixtures and compositions, and after they mashed together, they were isolated. And this opened opportunities for speciation and diversification, um, not only for Sulawesi, but for Wallace in general, and making and this made Wallace into a very rich um, crossover zone that had species characteristic of both Asia and Australia. My study site, the island of Sulawesi, um, was created by that collision of crusts and is officially the wonkiest island in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it is also a very mountainous one, and this makes it an ideal place to study elevation gradients and how they play out in tropical island systems. Now, why are people, why are ecologists so interested in the elevation gradient? Research has found that it could be used as proxy for other abiotic factors. Other things change across this gradient, and it's and it is great and it's great to look at them in concert, working together as we expect to find them in nature, as opposed to you know creating a different lab that only looks at how temperature decreases or how the pressure decreases along the elevation gradient. It is also more fun to hike up a mountain. <laughs> <laughs> in the lab. Um, these abiotic factors are reflected in how the biotic community plays out, and this is first seen in plants. Researchers show that as elevations increase, the richness and diversity of species decrease, as well as the rate of above ground biomass, um, biomass accumulation. But here's the thing. Sulawesi has a wild origin story. It's a very weird species mix. It comes from a lot of different places. So do these patterns hold? So to recap, we have established that it is in a very biodiverse area. However, this biodiversity is not matched by research. And the re people researching there actually acknowledge in their papers that yes, we just don't have enough data to quantify this diversity. 
And the previous research that has been done only looked at higher elevations. There's been no research in the lowland elevations, which is bad news because these lowland forests are disappearing fast. Most of the forests in the lowland, not all of them are in good condition, and urban development, urban sprawl tend to favor lowlands just because of ease of access. And that's particularly true for Indonesia, which is a developing country. Indonesia requires solid policies to protect the, its disappearing forests, but before that, we need research that can inform these policies. And so I did research. Um, <laughs> my research questions are first, how do science plans and statutes of trees change across an elevation gradient, and how do tree species diversity change across an elevation gradient? My research site was Tangkoko Dua Sudara Nature Reserve. It is located in the north, northern tip of Sulawesi, um, one of the three places on the island that has an unbroken coast to summit forest and elevation gradient, and is about 1,600 square miles. It was established as a protected area 100 years ago last February, but, before, but even before it was officially acknowledged, the local communities have strong cultural ties to it and has been protected since well before then. So in the nature reserve, I placed three transects going from the coast <coughs> to the summit of Mount Tancoco, which is a volcano. And along these transects, I placed 33 plots sized 40 by 40 meters. So each transect had 11 plots at 100 meter elevation increments from zero to 1,000 meters above sea level. I only recorded trees that had a diameter of 10 centimeters or greater. And these trees were identified, and I measured the diameter and height to last branch. So, what did I find? First of all, basal area and tree density are not significantly correlated to elevation. This was unexpected, but it was not entirely a surprise because previous research, as I have stated, looked at the highlands. Patterns emerged from 700 meters above sea level upwards. Because my research extended all the way down to the coast, it's possible that these patterns are more muted in lower elevations. Tree height, however, is correlated to elevation. And this curve shows that the canopy tends to be lower here in the middle. This is surprising because we expect that at the upper elevations, thinner soils, or conversely at the lower elevations, there's a bigger edge effect and more disturbances. And so if anything was to happen, it was, well, I expected it to happen at the lower and upper ends, but no, here we see that something is happening here in the middle elevation. The middle elevation is experiencing more disturbances that restrain tree growth. My next finding is alpha diversity, or diversity within pots. They, are, they did not change significantly. This is also surprising because elevation studies look all the way down to the lowlands, and there, there should be a change. There should be a decrease, a significant decrease from the lowlands to the highlands of alpha diversity. And these results show that there is a different floristic pattern at play here. Taking into account the, the story, the geologic history of Sulawesi, and how the, how the species interact with each other, there may be a pattern here that needs to be teased out by further research. For beta diversity, or diversity between plots, I found significant results. <laughs> um, to reiterate, beta diversity quantifies how different each plot is to every other plot. The more plots you have, the more species you have, the more complex this comparison becomes, and linear equations no longer suffice to explain it. And so I used NMDS, which is a multivariate approach to quantify species population. And fortunately, NMDS can be visually represented in a fairly straightforward manner. The graph on this side, on your left, there shows the values of species composition for each plot. Small dots represent the plots, and the larger dots represent the mean values of elevation. Recall that I had three plots per elevation. And what you see there is that the continuum kind of curves a little bit, and there's not a lot of overlap between the lines for each elevation band. And this is saying three things. First of all, that each elevation has a distinct composition of species. Second, these groups change markedly along an elevation gradient. And third, as you can 
can see by the regression of the N and the S axis and elevation, this change is statistically significant. Species are swapping in and out of um, the of the forest as the along the elevation gradient. And you can another thing that you can see from the graph there is that while the lines don't overlap much, the elevations tend to be clustered. Over here, we see the lower elevations, 0 to 300, occupying this end of the graph, higher elevation, 700 to 1,000 on this end of the graph, and the middle 400 to 600 lie at the overlap of the elevations. And so, I, so for my research, I found some things that we previously didn't know about this forest ecosystem. Firstly, that the size and tree density doesn't change. However, the tree height does. And this relationship, and it shows a quadratic relationship, and the fact that middle elevations of smaller stature indicate that there are other factors restraining their growth, and this needs to be investigated by further research. Secondly, alpha diversity does not change, but the beta diversity does, and communities can be coarsely grouped into distinct elevation bands. This is very important for forest management policies, because this means that you can't treat the forest as one homogeneous unit. Depending on elevations, they should be treated as different ecosystems because it's been empirically, it's been shown empirically that it can be divided into different zones. And secondly, for any urban, urban landscapes or forest um, restoration policies, the species composition, depending on the target size, needs to be taken into account for the uh, program to be successful. These are the references that I used for my research, and I have a lot of people to thank. I'd like to thank the funders um, for making it possible, my research team for their help in the field, my advisors for their advice, and the Action Research Lab for, work, for helping me work on this for the past year or so. And thank you for listening, and I will take questions. <laughs> yeah, that one. So, um, you know, with the, with the Shannon Index, with the Simpsons Index, I mean, you know, you could, what, so why have, are you using an hypothesis of linear change? Why not try and fit a quadratic through that? And that, you've got a hump shape. Actually, in diversity, um, you know, and, and, and that might actually help you to sort of get at patterns in the data a little more rigorously. That is really great input. <laughs> I did not think of that, but um, yeah, I have no explanation why I only use linear. But um, thank you for your input. I will definitely check for that okay. um, before the PRI. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned uh, 
Um, so, or we, we saw the hump with the mid elevations, and you had mentioned maybe it being related to disturbance or something like that. The, and do you think that is something natural or anthropogenic? Or do you have any, any hypotheses as to why it's in the middle um, elevation? I doubt it's anthropogenic because the communities around the reserve are very protected, very protected, even to the extent that the local. Um, the, the equivalent of the Forest Service can't even build trains in there because they're like, no, we're not changing anything about this. Um, maybe something else that could, um, an, a form of disturbance that could explain this. Again, like this is just me thinking, not I don't actually have any results to back this up, but um, because my research site is a volcano, um, the, so the soil there very well drained. There were no rivers in that forest going down into the ocean, at least from the mountain summit, um, originating from the mountain that I was um, researching. Um, and it is possible that in the middle elevations, it's just drought, less water. Um, that would be that would be the ex explanation for the disturbance if that was the factor at play here. Uh, is there a reason why you only uh, went up in elevation to a uh, thousand meters above sea level? Uh, um, because yeah. I, I expect the, uh, that, that the higher you go up in elevation that you see a more significant change in, in species composition and biodiversity. Right. Um, so that's a good question. I think that what I was after when I set up my um, research design Um, was that I was after an unbroken continuum in the same area. And the mountain only goes to 1,100 or almost 1,100. So um, I cut it off at 1,000. If I was not looking at a continuum on in the same ecosystem, I could have gone up to almost 2,000. But um, yeah, that was my reason for cutting it off at 1,000. Um, also, the... 700, 800 meters above sea level had been had been researched before, and um, I think this would contribute to that knowledge gap of the lower elevation, new information. Thanks, Thomas.